Hello, and welcome to episode 211 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Tech Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore Submarine Squadron 3 at Pearl Harbor, and many other assignments. How are you this afternoon, Bill? Doing great, Seth. Really, really anxious to get into Kolomangara today. We're going to cover a couple of events here, yeah, and they're and they're both intimately related, both with one another and the event that we just talked about in our previous episode, which of course was Kula Golf. So on the night of July 6, 1943, speaking of Kula Golf, an American cruiser and destroyer force under the command of Admiral Walden Ainsworth engaged an inferior Japanese troop transport convoy of destroyers and proceeded to slug it out with the Japanese in a fast and furious barrage of gunfire and a bevy of long lance torpedoes. The fight, known to history as the Battle of Kula Golf, ended in a sort of a draw, in my opinion, and I know in Bill's opinion, too, it's an actual defeat for the United States. While the Americans inflicted damage on the enemy and sunk one destroyer in the process, the U.S. suffered the loss of the light cruiser Helena and allowed the Japanese to complete their mission of landing infantry reinforcements on New Georgia, albeit not fully. Just six nights later, the Japanese would try to run another troop convoy into the area to add more meat to the fight that was as late, turning into a bit of a stalemate on the jungle island of New Georgia. Again, that fleet would be met by Ainsworth and his cruiser and destroyer task force, and again, the fight would be fast and furious, and again, the results would be less than stellar and less than what they should have been. A month later, the seas around New Georgia and the surrounding islands brewed up into yet another naval engagement, this time off of the shores of the aforementioned Kolombangara, but this time in the Vela Gulf. New tactics were tried by the Americans in this one, and the results achieved would dictate further U.S. destroyer tactics for the remainder of the war. And we'll get to we'll get to Vela Golf in a second, but let's talk about Vela Golf first, Bill. Let's. It's basically, if you listen to Kula Golf, it's basically the same cast of characters minus Helena, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Helena's gone, unfortunately, at this point. And if you remember from the last episode, there was this heroic, movie-worthy rescue of most of Helena's 1,200 crew members that included, you know, Captain Bly, like, sail across to... um, to, to, to back to New Georgia, where one group of sailors was rescued on New Georgia. Another group um, went all the way to Vela Gulf, which we're going to talk about today, and the island of Vela La Vela, where they were, you know, identified by natives and coast watchers and rescued in a line of destroyers that were sent up to rescue them. So this is a movie-worthy story with a really sad ending of, you know, 100 and 68 or so um, Helena sailors being KIA and the loss of the ship itself. So here we are just a few days later. And the question is, has Admiral Ainsworth, who didn't know that long lance torpedoes existed at the beginning of the Battle of Kula Gulf, how he how that happened, we'll never know, right? I mean, it's right. remarkable it's, that an admiral didn't know the the long lens torpedo existed at this stage in the war. But has he learned from Kula Gulf and is the rest of this operation that we're going to talk about today going to go any better for him? We shall see, shall we? (laughs) (laughs) To your point, Bill, Bill, uh, Bill believed, Ainsworth believed that he had inflicted a decisive defeat on the Japanese at Kula Gulf. And as we exposed in the last episode it was anything but you know, frankly i mean he did damage for sure but it was certainly not any kind of decisive defeat um in reality the japanese had certainly they'd been damaged as i said you know one destroyer had been sunk up right another had been lost when it became beached and later strafed by allied aircraft however despite this the japanese were able to reinforce their positions in and around the new georgia area with 1600 guys that they dropped off at vila The success of the previous resupply run and the manner in which it was executed and responded to by the Americans, for that matter, encouraged the Japanese to do it again. The Japanese knew that losing New Georgia, specifically Munda, would put Rabaul and their other holdings in the area in dire straits. Therefore, they resorted to the tried and true tactics of running people to shore on these fast destroyers. Again, just a couple nights before it worked, 
you know, not marvelously, but it did. It certainly worked. So they're like, why the hell not try it again? And that's exactly what they do here. Um, on the night of July the 12th and 13th, another troop convoy carrying a further 1,200 Japanese infantry and supplies was planned. The task force would consist of 10 ships, again, just exactly as they had done before. This time, they bring a light cruiser to the party, uh, the cruiser Jintsu, uh, five destroyer escorts, and four destroyer transports. So what are they bringing here? I mean, what is their goal? Of, what is the Japanese goal of this of this operation, Bill? Well, they, they thought that there would be a big battle in Kulamagara, which, you know, they thought, you know, well, we're going to learn from our lessons in Guadalcanal. We had trouble establishing reinforcements and supplies on Guadalcanal, which was a much bigger island, frankly, than Kulamagara, because we waited too late. There's too much jungle to traipse through, um, too much disease. The, the campaign lasted six months. So what we need to do here is make sure that we've re reinforced it in advance of need. And that's kind of what the thought was here. They they realized we were going to attack Kolombangar at some point. They want to build up the forces in advance of need, the, kind of the opposite of what had happened on Guadalcanal when we landed in strength before they could reinforce the island. And so, you know, the, that's the thing they're doing here with these, what we would call APDs, the destroyer transports, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they're just trying to build up the, the soldier inventory on the island before we uh, do our initial landings. Yep. And then and they're doing it around the clock, pretty much. They're doing it pretty rapidly right. and they're doing it with great success, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, now, Australian Coast Watchers uh, spot the Japanese troop convoy as it leaves Rabaul at 0530 on the morning of July the 12th. Uh, Allied aerial recon that had basically, well, not basically, lost the uh, previous convoy as it was heading towards Kula Gulf. Um, they spot this convoy as it's leaving Rabaul, but then again, they lose it. They lose it again for the remainder of that day. And I mean, this is not this is not saying that the you know Allied air forces that were watching these guys were not doing a good job. They were doing fine. This is about the weather that's in the area. This is about the cloud cover that's in the area. This is, you know, there's many, many factors that are factoring into the fact that we continually lose these convoys at really the worst possible time to lose mm -hmm. them. Um, despite that, Admiral Halsey gets word from the Coast Watchers and what little aerial recon is available to see these people that the convoy is leaving Rabaul and immediately sends word to Ainsworth to turn around and head right back up into that area, you know, take care of what you need to take care of and get your people back up into that area through the slot and prepare to defend and attack and destroy another inbound Japanese troop convoy. Yeah. So, and he had three cruisers at Kula Gulf. He had Helena, Honolulu and St. Louis. He lost Helena. So he pulls in a New Zealand, a Kiwi cruiser named Leander. And so he adds that basically the hopes that she would be a worthy replacement for Helena. And the three cruisers and her collection of destroyers get underway under the auspices of Crew Div 9 again. Mm -hmm. And Leander, this is the first time we mention her because this is really the first time she sees much action in the Pacific, but she was not a green ship by any means. Like Honolulu and St. Louis, she's a light cruiser. Uh, she had been built in 1931 and was commissioned in 33. In 1937, Leander was loaned from the Royal Navy to the Royal New Zealand Navy. Um, she was a pretty good sized ship. You know, she was just a tad smaller than the American cruisers that were sailing with her. But the thing was, is she was slower. She was significantly slower by about five knots slower than the American ships that were with her. So as, as we've said before, Bill, I mean, the task force can only move as fast as its slowest ship. And Leander is that slower ship in this task force. And she had um, fewer guns, too. I think she only had eight yeah. six-inch guns, as yeah. opposed to the remarkable 15 six-inch guns that our light cruisers had. So um, and we've referred to them a few times, used, leveraging the Japanese expression, our machine gun cruisers, because they could fire in automatic mode, which made yeah. them look like machine guns. And, and Leander couldn't do that either. So she no. was slower, smaller, and and underarmed relative to the American cruisers that she sailed with. 
Indeed. But but she was battle experienced, as we said before. She she had uh, earlier in the war, she'd served in the Mediterranean, seen plenty of action. She actually was credited with sinking the Italian armed merchantman Ram, R-A-M-B, and had captured a Vichy French ship in 1941. In 43, she was deployed to the Pacific where gunships were needed more there than they were in the Med. Uh, and And to your point, she was underarmed. Uh, she didn't have the rate of fire. She was slower, but she was a gun platform, and that's what was needed after the loss of Helena. Um, mm-hmm. Aside from the addition of Leander, Ainsworth now had beefed up his destroyer complement. He only had a handful at Kula Gulf. He's got 10 at his disposal here. Um in just a couple of weeks, the Allied naval might in this area had swelled significantly in terms of destroyers. We were pumping out the Fletcher class. We were, you know, still had some of the earlier pre-war class destroyers in the area. So this was destroyer city out here. And there's a lot of them out there. Um, the overwhelming majority of ships at the Allied planning tables at this time are light cruisers and destroyers. Um why is this? You know, people are going to ask, why, where are the heavy cruisers? Where are the battle wagons? You know, the carriers are going to be moving towards the Central Pacific Drive that we'll talk about in later episodes. But but where are the big boys? You know, where are the big ships, Bill? Yeah, the, you know, most of them have been taken out of action, either sunk in Savile Island. Remember that episode? Go back and play it if you don't know what we're talking about. Or they were being repaired from um, sucking up torpedoes and things like that. So, the light cruisers were the biggest we had in this area. And by the way, the, the the waters are so constrained in these areas, there's not a lot of maneuvering room for bigger ships. So it's not inappropriate that the best, the biggest ships we had in this area were the light cruisers. Um, they're probably even too big for the need based on how constrained these waters are. And last yeah. week I went into great detail was showing a bunch of maps and how constrained the waters are. The, go back and refer to those maps because they're germane today. I could show one or two if we need to, Seth. But but I think people get the idea that we're talking about an area around New Georgia where it's it's you know, six miles across and you could barely turn around. Um, I'm I'm being a little bit tongue in cheek when I say that, uh, well, you know. But very constrained within I- artillery shore bombardment range. Yeah, I don't think you're being tongue in cheek. I, I think you're being accurate because when you've got a float, you know, you've got a task force. It's not just mm-hmm. one ship. Yeah, you can swing one ship around, you know, you know, any 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 which way you want within six miles. But when you've got ten, that, <laughs> that significantly significantly limits your ability to maneuver in the tight confines of this particular area. So I think you're right on, man. I think you're dead on. So. Task Force 18 is what this is dubbed uh, under Ainsworth. They sail from Tulagi at 1,700 hours on July the 12th. Now, again, he's aware that there's an enemy convoy coming. His orders are to intercept said convoy and destroy it. Uh, Ainsworth's force makes its way north from Tulagi, then moves along the western coast of Santa Isabella. Uh, island to avoid aerial detection by snooping Japanese aircraft. So, you know, we were not the only ones that had aerial recon in the area. Um, the mm-hmm. Japanese also performed this type of reconnaissance, you know, with regularity. They they would consistently put aircraft in the area. And Ainsworth's concern about snoopers was very well founded, uh, as they are indeed, the Japanese are indeed out looking for any American surface force that might be in the area that would potentially intercept said convoy as it travels down towards the New Georgia area. So much so that an American fighter does intercept uh, a Japanese snooper and shoots it down that very evening. So the Japanese are out and they are on the hunt for Ainsworth and his people. And we're going to take a break here for a second and talk about this one particular type of aircraft, because these things are about as utilitarian as it could possibly be. Now, you're wondering where the hell are the American eyes or the allied eyes in the air at night? And we briefly touched on this. John Parshall and I talked about it when we did the barroom brawl. We were talking about PBYs flying at night, but we didn't go into any specifics. But we're going to here because you're going to hear about these guys for the remainder of the war. PBY Catalinas that were so-called black cats, and these aircraft are just friggin' cool, um, were stalking the area looking for the Japanese convoy. 
They eventually do cite them off of Vizu Vizu. Uh, the cats called out their position, which was picked up by Ainsworth. Now, the black cats, Bill, let, let, let's talk about these guys. We're not talking about the felines here, obviously. We're right. talking about PBY Catalinas that were painted a matte black specifically to blend into the night sky to do a variety of missions. I mean, they, these things were a jack of all trades, right? Yeah, they were. They were large. They were lumbering. They were slow. They were seaplanes. Um, you know, in many cases, these were the, uh, the, the PBY, not necessarily the black cats, but the PBY itself. Um, it was the kind of plane that, that uh, the most senior leaders would use to get around the Pacific because there wasn't developed, you know, runways and long range transport aircraft that could get from a land base to a land base to a land base. So oftentimes even Nimitz, Halsey would travel by Catalina and uh, you know land on the water. But these airplanes in particular were wonderful because they were manned by you know eight or nine crew members. Um, they could stay aloft a long time. They were you could think of them as the drones of the day, even though they're mm -hmm. human, you know, manned by humans. They were the way today you would use a drone aircraft to stay aloft for a long period of time and conduct surveillance. In those days, the best you could do is you can do any better than with a, a PBY Catalina. And so these airplanes being painted black, cat, Catalina, it's a play on words, obviously were very effective maritime patrol aircraft. And I'm, I'm very proud that in April, I'll be giving a talk to the Maritime Patrol Aircraft Association up, up in Jacksonville, Florida. And, and I could say a few words about the their wonderful legacy in the Catalinas during World War II. Yeah, these things, these things are vital to the Pacific War. You know, literally from day one, there were PBYs that were shot up on Ford Island by the Japanese when they attacked on December 7th. The PBYs are, are not black cats, but PBYs sighted the Japanese fleet off of Midway. They sighted the Japanese uh, Kitabutai off of Midway Island on June 4, 42. Um, these things provided you know, invaluable uh, reconnaissance off the shores of Guadalcanal during the struggle for the canal. And they are literally the perfect airplane for doing what they're going to do tonight and what they're going to do in Vela Gulf in a couple of nights after this. And that, to Bill's point, they had an incredible range. I mean, these things could really get out there. And the distance uh, of the area that they're patrolling here is not very far which means they have all this fuel and they can stay aloft for hours and hours and hours, which I'm sure the crewmen weren't exactly thrilled about, but no. it was incredibly important to, to, to the task at hand here, because if they did spot a Japanese convoy, which they do here, they basically hang with this sucker all night long because they can, because they have the longevity okay. to be able to do that. While trying to remain undetected, which isn't right. all that easy for an airplane, right? Nice. Particularly after um, air search radar was invented on the Japanese side, it was, became very difficult. Yeah. But to, to that end, the Black Cats became the bane of Japanese nocturnal operations, really from this point on. They played a part in the canal. We talked about that. But really from here on, and I do mean on for the remainder of the war, in tight confines like New Georgia, Bougainville, Rabal, you'll see him again in the Philippines. These things are vital. So, I mean, they they play a big role, and they're just cool, cool airplane. Um, this particular black cat uh, reported Japanese Admiral Isaki's destroyer force to be only 26 miles away from Ainsworth's position at this point in time, uh, dialing up 28 knots, which was as fast as Leander could go. Remember, if you recall, we said that she was the slowest ship in this task force. The task force sped towards Kolombangara. Now, the Black Cat is going to keep their eyes on this Japanese task force as long as they physically can until they get shot down or are forced to retire from whatever way. Um Bill, what's Ainsworth's plan here? He learned a little bit from Kula Golf when it comes to destroyers, but not a whole hell of a lot, did he? No, he was going to break off a section of destroyers, I think maybe five of them, to launch a torpedo attack before the gunfire, which is the Japanese now have been doing this from the since the beginning of the war. And finally, finally, somebody whispers into Ainsworth's ear and, and says, hey, Admiral, you know, 
you know, in the last episode, I said, you can have your cake and eat it too. If you lo launch those torpedoes before they know you're there, when the torpedoes go boom, you open up with gunfire, you, you get a double whammy, right? And so finally, he allows five of his destroyers to launch their torpedo attack before opening up with gunfire. Uh, but is it effective, Seth? Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> We shall see. We shall see. Yeah. And so so we had talked about in Kula Golf that Ainsworth, and you, you mentioned it in the beginning of this one, that Ainsworth was unaware of the existence of the Japanese long lance. And he learned the hard way that the Japanese torpedoes, A, had incredible distance, B, had incredible speed, and C, had incredible power when they yeah. gutted Helena. So he was fully aware now. Um, a day late and a dollar short, but he's he's fully aware that the Japanese possess these mighty weapons. And his plan is to, like you said, fire torpedoes. And then when the torpedoes go kaboom, open up with gunfire and immediately turn away from the Japanese torpedoes that he assumes will soon be in the water. Again, good plan if he can make it work. Mm -hmm. Um so as the allies are rounding and and we're it seems like we might be moving fast through this episode and I assure you we're not trying to we're not missing anything this this battle and the next one are like boom boom I mean there's there's not a lot of action that goes down but it's all very important that's the reason we're lumping these into these two into one here so as the allies are rounding the tip of Kolomangara at around 0, 0100 Honolulu's radar set lights up with enemy contacts a voice on the TBS says and I quote I smell a skunk, unquote, which is great. I love, I love the 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 sarcasm as it's being played across here. It's very evident that the Japanese are in the neighborhood here. Mm -hmm. At zero one hundred, USS Nicholas, who we talked about before, visually sights the Japanese, firmly believing he had surprised the Japanese. Ainsworth gives an order to the destroyer Nicholas to speed up and commence a torpedo attack as his cruisers make a turn to expose their broadsides and train their turrets to starboard before they open fire. Again, and by the way, plan. Seth, I'm reminded that somebody commented on one of our episodes that that the uh, crossing the T maneuver and broadsides, no, there's no such thing as a broadside with a modern ship because you could train the guns. Um, I understand the point, but I disagree. <laughs> You want all of your gun, be able to bring all of your guns to bear. And the only way to do that is to expose the broadside, the beam of the ship. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a distinction without a difference. And so that's, he did exactly the right thing here by trying to maneuver to expose the broadsides because um, four and a half guns only work when you're a beam of the target. For sure. No, 100% right. The Japanese, and this is interesting. This is very interesting. We had an earlier episode where we said, uh, I believe it was Battle of Cape Esperance, where we were talking about uh, Americans, admirals, I believe it was, yeah, it was Norman Scott turning off the radar because they were there was fear that the Japanese had a radar detecting device, which at that time they did not. However, now, a year later, they do. They do. Right. Despite their lack of radar within this specific task force, if you recall from Kula Gulf, we said Niizuki, which was the destroyer that was sunk by American gunfire, did have radar. None of the destroyers in this task force do, but they have a radar detecting device. Uh, this device received and plotted the electrical impulses put out by American radar. By utilizing this new device, Admiral Isaki was able to discern both the presence and disposition of American ships long before. Ainsworth's radar screens showed Izaki to be present. So, again, yeah. and maybe believing. people will know this, but just for the benefit of everybody, if you've got a radar detecting device, which in modern language is called electronic surveillance measures or ESM, and it's the same with active sonar, the detecting device can detect the presence of that radar and or active sonar twice the range that the radar or active sonar can detect a target. So you can see the radar long before the radar can see you, which is why submarines don't go active on sonar, because somebody can hear that sonar at twice the range that I can detect something with my active sonar. So the Japanese are able to track the American radars long before the American radars are going to detect the Japanese ships. And that's an important point. And when Bill says long, he means long. Because Isaki had been tracking Ainsworth for two hours, mm -hmm. two hours before I mean, he wasn't Bill wasn't kidding when he said long time, 
two hours, Isaki was aware that Ainsworth or an American force was inbound. So he was fully aware that there were going to be there was going to be a fight here in the very near future. At 0103, five minutes before the USS Nicholas sighted the Japanese, Ainsworth's task force was visually sighted by the Japanese. And we've gone into Japanese lookouts and their incredible night vision and the incredible night optics ad nauseum. And we won't do that again here, but just suffice it to say that even now, the human eye is proving to be better than American radar in these close, tight confines of this fight that's about to brew up here in just a second. Um, as soon as the Japanese have Ainsworth's people in visual range, they do their tried and true tactic and they launch their long lance torpedoes. Um, as soon as they launch them, they do their, again, their tried and true tactic of Peeling away, and away. getting out of there. Yeah. As the Japanese torpedoes are speeding through the water, Nicholas and the four DDs in the American column launch their torpedoes as well. And they direct them at the Japanese light cruiser Jintsu, which is the largest target on their radar. I mean, this is not a wrong thing to do, right, Bill? I mean, they're shooting at the biggest ship. No. Yeah. You, you, can we, we actually had that discussion when we talked about submarine tactics and who do you attack first? And the, if you think you have the element of surprise um, and you think that things are going to start maneuvering, ships are going to start maneuvering after the first thing blows up, you want the first thing to blow up to be the biggest target, you know, the most important target. So it's it's not wrong for them to do this. Yeah, and 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 they they perform very well here. Uh, Jensu now has also spotted USS Nicholas Uh she does what Japanese ships do. Bam. She flips on her searchlights and illuminates, illuminates the American destroyer. Uh, as soon as she does this, she is absolutely smothered by American naval gunfire. And I'm talking within seconds. They'd already registered her as the primary target. They being the American cruisers and the, the Kiwi cruiser had, had registered her as the largest target, as the primary target, rather. And as soon as she flips on that searchlight, boom, everything opens up at once. Um, mm -hmm. The American column, or the Allied column, I should say, erupts in gunfire from a range of about 9,000 yards and fires over Jensu. Overhead, the Black Cat that we were talking about before has radioed Ainsworth, the Japanese position. He, he's spotting the fall of shot now. He's above the battle watching all this go down. Um, after Honolulu's first two salvos fall over the Jensu, PBY signals up to, quote, unquote, Next salvo was a hit. Rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah he's and by the way, remember that aircraft, uh, cruisers, and battleships carried um, float planes for you know a long, the majority of the war, specifically to do this kind of thing. So this is a fairly uh, firm tactic, as well developed tactic for aircraft to spot gunfire and provide gunfire support um, and and targeting support to the ships that are firing the guns. So in this case, it's a PBY doing it, which isn't less common than the organic float plane from the cruiser that's doing the firing, but it's happened, you know, for the last 10, 15 years. Oh yeah. Yeah. And and as as the Black Cat is calling in the the fall of shot, uh the Americans are adjusting their fire. And the next salvo that is fired by Honolulu is dead on, and it smacks right into Jinsu. And as this occurs, Ainsworth just tells everybody, cut loose, and they just let it go. Um, he orders his two uh, cruisers, as well as Leander, but Leander can't do this. He orders them to fire on automatic continuous mode. We talked about this before with USS Helena. Um, where Honolulu and St. Louis basically open the firing keys on their main batteries. And as fast as the auto loaders can pump rounds into the breaches, these things are shooting. The volume of fire that is poured at Jinsu by the American cruiser specifically, these two, Honolulu and St. Louis, is absolutely mind boggling. Wrap your heads around this for a second, guys. In mere minutes, some 2,300 rounds are pumped at this one Japanese ship just by the American cruisers. It's incredible. Just by the seals. It's that 
cruiser gunfire mode and it just it just oh, there's, there's no way to survive that if if you're halfway accurate and oh, geez if you're if only a fifth of the rounds hit that's still 400 rounds and so 500 rounds yeah you're, you're not going to survive that and she does not <laughs> i mean she takes she takes multiple hits and is seen mm -hmm. to explode uh, it is thought that her magazines explode they actually don't she just takes such a pummeling at the hands of the American cruisers that she just, it just looks like she explodes. Um, aside from the shell hits, she takes at least what we know to be one torpedo hit uh, that it, that does crack her in half and, and upon which she sinks almost instantly. But I mean, this thing is just blanketed by American mm -hmm. gunfire. And then the coup de gras is the torpedo that, that cracks her in half. Our torpedoes are starting to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's about time. time to work. Yeah, 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 no kidding. So, Bill, after Jintsu is destroyed, what does Ainsworth do here? What, what, what's going on? Well, his plan was to, to shoot the torpedoes and then maneuver, which is what the Japanese are doing as well, by the way. And in the confusion of the battle, some of these ships don't hear this order to execute maneuver. And so remember, you have a plan, and then during the battle, you provide execute orders on when to execute each element of the plan. Uh, let's say Corp and 90, which means come to course 90, 90090, and then ready, execute. And then there's flag signals that go along that, there's light signals, they're using talk between ships. There's different methods that you use to, to, to signal the fact that you want that element of the plan executed now. Well, in the heat of the battle, whether they could, it was noise, you know, kind of saturated talk between ships or whatever. Several of the ships didn't hear, in particular, Leander did not hear the order to execute the maneuver. Um, and so, you know, she, Le Leander was essentially deaf at this point. Yeah. And, and it, she's going to pay for that, you know, disability here real quick because the Japanese do indeed have long lances in the water as the long lances are spotted and they, they are visually spotted. The allied shaped ships take evasive course action. They go, I mean, they scatter to the four winds here. They go all over creation, trying to avoid these Japanese torpedoes that are now in the water. This throws the column in further disarray and causes almost near collisions. They almost run into each other a couple of times, um, well, as the ship throughout the war, this, these kind of maneuvers will cause collisions and sometimes yeah. more damage in the collisions than it did on both sides, Japanese and American, than than the you know weapons themselves did. Yeah, and as as this chaos is now you know unfolding in the in the Allied column, column Leander makes a very wide turn to avoid a the the allied ships in the column and b the torpedoes coming and unfortunately she turns right into the path of a torpedo uh the torpedo strikes her dead amidships and blows a huge hole in her hull 26 of her crew are killed immediately and she slows to a crawl credit to her builders here and her damage control her dc party works a minor miracle and keeping this thing afloat. Mm -hmm. Helena took three torpedoes, two of which really killed her, the bow gate and blown off, and then the, the one amidships that eviscerated her. This, uh, Leander takes one amidships, and it it tears a hole in her, but she does not go down. Her DC party, you know, they perform a miracle by keeping this thing afloat, and she actually mm -hmm. is able to limp away, and she does make it out of the fight, which is... Yeah. Something almost the steps that she would have of. taken would have been to isolate the flooding and and then the counter flood to write the list. And, and in isolating the flooding, you've got to make some very, very painful decisions to actually, in, in many cases, trap sailors in the compartment because you've got to stop the flooding very quickly before you mm -hmm. take on too much water to the point where when you counter flood, which reduces your free buoyancy even further, you, you, you need you know reserve buoyancy enough to stay afloat. So speed is of the essence when you isolate the, the flooding. And that sometimes means sailors get trapped inside the air that's being flooded. And then counter flooding to write the list to make sure that you don't capsize. And then you, you get away at best speed at that point. But they, they executed it perfectly. Absolutely. Absolutely perfectly. 
credit to the crew, credit to the mm-hmm. DC party. They are able to get Leandra out of there. Uh, the lurking black cat that's still overhead throughout this whole thing uh, sends a report that a column of Japanese destroyers are turning away and proceeding north at high speed. Ainsworth detaches Nicholas O'Bannon and USS Taylor to give chase to the Japanese. Uh, opinions aboard the American ships are that they have destroyed everything afloat. And at least they think that they've sunk four enemy ships, when in reality, all they've sunk is Jinsu, which is significant, but it's only one. And mm-hmm. the rest are just getting away. <laughs> They're just leaving the area. Um, I don't see them on radar anymore. We must have sunk them. Yeah. And that's a common thing that goes on through, you know, really through the war is that if there's a target on radar and you're shooting at that target and that target disappears, you think that you sunk that target. That's not just that's not always the case. Sometimes it is. But this particular time and really most particular times, that is not the case, is it? No, no. They they were actually they all you need to really do is scoot behind the island. Right. And so Kolomagara is you know, a fairly large island, and behind that is going to be Vela La Vela Island. And so there are a bunch of nooks and crannies that you can hide in and escape detection by radar. And so you don't know that you've sunk a ship here unless you've actually seen it go down. Right. And that's, unfortunately, they've only seen one ship go down. So at 0156, Honolulu's radar picks up another radar contact some distance, 23,000 yards. So it's, you know, a, a pretty pretty good ways out there. Uh, not knowing whether they were friends or enemy, Ainsworth orders star shells to illuminate the target. As the star shells explode over what he assumes to be Japanese destroyers, it turns out that they are indeed Japanese destroyers. The enemy ships are seen turning away. So it's usually a sign of one thing coming. Um, Ainsworth yeah. assumes that they have just fired torpedoes, and they did. And right. turns away to unmask his broadside. Yeah, he's getting there. <laughs> he's yeah, getting he's there. He he turns away to unmask his broadside again, like he like we talked about before, uh, to open fire. And at this point, runs straight into the track of these long lances that had just been launched. In my opinion, I don't think I don't, I don't want to pin the blame on Ainsworth here for doing this. What he did was actually, in my opinion, right. He just had bad luck. What, what do you yeah, say? You, you, you don't know the direction to which you, the Japanese are going to fire those torpedoes. You assume they're going to fire the torpedoes to the to an intercept point. Boy, have we talked to hammer to this point home about 42 times. An intercept point, which is going to be based on the course you were steaming previously. And, you know, that's probably what they would have done. But sometimes they don't know. They assume you're going to maneuver. And so they fire a spread of torpedoes. You remember the old airborne air launch torpedo tactic that we referred to in early episode season one that's called the hammer and anvil. You assume that the enemy is going to maneuver and you fire your spread of torpedoes in such a way that regardless of what course they maneuver to, something's going to hit them. Yep. And so you don't fire it based on an assumed course and an assumed maneuver to an intercept point. You fire them almost to a random collection of courses. And that's what gets the St. Louis in this case. So you're right, Seth, I agree. He didn't do anything wrong here. The Japanese just had a tactic that anticipated pretty much anything he was going to do. Mm-hmm. And and to your point, St. Louis is just rocked by a torpedo explosion. Seconds later, Honolulu maneuvers wildly to avoid one fish in the water. And she, too, actually, she, I'm sorry, she evades four torpedoes. And the fifth smacks her just at the tip of the bow. Um, <clears throat> she'd almost evaded that one, too. And by the tip of the bow, I do mean literally the tip of the bow. Um, USS Gwyn, just ahead of Honolulu, takes a long lance of midships and simply just explodes. Kaboom. I mean, you, you remember that Gwyn was one of the destroyers that helped rescue the Helena survivors, um, I believe, on, on the island of St. Georgia, uh, New, New Georgia itself. Mm-hmm. Yep, 100%. Gwen's crew is picked up by Ralph Talbot. This is a DD that we talked about last episode. And then, as Bill said last week, you can hear about a lot. 
Um, 61 of Gwen's crew are killed during the ship's episode. And I do mean literally explodes. Like she's there one minute and then gone the next. It just kaboom. Yeah. Whether it was the torpedoes or a gun magazine that, that went up, but something, something yeah. exploded. It's it, it's a bad state of affairs, really. A after the American ships and the and the New Zealand ship are smacked by uh, the torpedoes, they perform, and it, this is true, they perform amazing damage control. We've already talked about Leander and her DC parties, but St. Louis and Honolulu do basically the exact same thing. Um, there's pictures that I'll show, you know, in this episode of of their damage that they sustained after this event when they do make it back to Tulagi. And you look at these pictures and you're like, how the hell did these things stay afloat? Mm -hmm. Their DC parties work minor, minor miracles. And it's 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 a tribute to them that the that you hear these ships' names later on through the war because they do survive yeah. this incident. So, you know, it's a quick in and out thing. I mean, this fight barely lasts an hour. <clears throat> and if you look at it, Bill, this battle is a Japanese victory. It really is. And this is really the second time in a row, because, I mean, Kula Gulf, for all intents and purposes, is a Japanese victory. This is really no different, is it? Yeah, the Japanese were outgunned in both battles. In the first, you can you know, technically call it a draw. But since we outgunned them, that, that's why you and I refer to it as a, um, you know, an effective loss. In this case, again, we're outgunning the Japanese. We do sink one of their you know, their biggest ship. Um, but we get, you know, three ships, you know, plus the New Zealand ship that, that are struck by long lance torpedoes taking the, all those ships out of action. So, yeah, I think this one is not even debatable. It goes down as a loss. So, again, you remember we referred to in the last episode of the Ainsworth Express, where I think he started believing some of his own hype. The Ainsworth Express was... Uh, there to neutralize the Tokyo Express. Yeah, not so much. He's yeah. he keeps coming up on with a short straw in these engagements. Yeah, he does. And and you know, it's not to say he I I, I firmly believe that he learned after Kula Golf. You know, I mean, just by dis mm -hmm. by the display of the tactics that he executed here, he definitely learned from his mistakes at Kula Golf. The guy was a smart guy. But, but every he lesson a, he learns costs it, it takes the loss of one or more ships for him yeah. to learn that lesson. I think yeah. Nimitz would say we can't keep going at that exchange rate. Yeah. Yeah. And that's unfortunately is exactly what happens. And you, you talk about Chester Nimitz and this is a point that, that we wanted to bring up here too. After the loss of St. Louis and Honolulu, and to be clear, they weren't lost. They didn't sink, but they're out of out of action for a long time. The Solomon's Area Navy, as we're going to call it, is essentially bereft of cruisers. Like, we don't have any left to throw in the fight. The heavy cruisers were all either sunk or heavily damaged during the Guadalcanal campaign. Now, the light cruisers that, are, that, that we have, we've either had them sunk or we've had Helena, them torpedoed. Helena was sunk and the rest of them were damaged and taken yeah. out of action. So what does Nimitz do here, Bill? Well, he says, you know, there's, there's something going on here. Maybe it's the cruisers themselves that are, you know, becoming torpedo magnets. Maybe they're not maneuverable enough. For whatever reason, every time we send cruisers in, they we lose them. And so maybe we got to stop doing that. You know, the old joke about what's the definition of insanity. Keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. So, well, it turns out he didn't have much of a decision to make because we were I plumb out of cruisers. Mm -hmm. So... His, his decision was we we're going to, you know, even if we got some cruisers back, we're going to try to fight the rest of this campaign in the Solomon's Islands, primarily with destroyers. Mm -hmm. Which is the appropriate tactic to do or the appropriate decision to make, I should say. I mean, not that Chet Nimitz does too many things that are wrong, but this no. is definitely this is definitely a tick in the yes, you're right box, because to your point, the area is just too damn small to be maneuvering, you know big ships in and these light cruisers did despite their classification light cruisers these are big ships and they're it's just too damn tight and, and there's yeah. too much room for <laughs> torpedoes to smack you whereas a dd is faster and more there's one there's one class of ship or maybe we should call it boat though that it is not these this water is not too tight for and what were those we haven't talked much about them yet those are the PTs, man. The PT boats are, are nifty little vessels, man. They're plywood, 
dinghies, as John Parshall called them one time. Mm. But these things pack a wallop. They've got, you know, four torpedoes per boat. They've got a plethora of automatic weapons, 20 millimeters, 40 millimeters. Some of them have larger guns than that. 50 calibers out the wazoo. These things are fast. They're incredibly mm -hmm. maneuverable and they pack a wallop. And this fight or the fighting that is going to continue in this area now basically becomes just that. It's a PT and destroyer war mm -hmm. from now on in these close confined waters. Um, and in 1943, John F. Kennedy might have been here on one of these PT boats by now. He, had, he was. He operated for a while out of the vicinity of Tulagi and and later, I think he operated out of um, out of Bougainville. But I don't know if he was involved in any of these actions here or not. Do you happen to know, Seth? Yeah, he was. Yeah, that this is where PT-109. Yeah, he was. This is where right around this time is where PT-109 gets cut in half by the Japanese destroyer. And uh, Kennedy does perform the actions that uh, that he is so well known for before his presidency here. But yeah, right. this is this is his area of of the war. And it was the PT DD area of combat. You know, this is this is where our destroyers really learned, uh, really honed the tactics that they will utilize for the rest of the war. And I say that because it sets up the next event that we're going to talk about in this very episode, which is the Battle of Vela Gulf. <clears throat> now, the Japanese had been consistently resupplying and reinforcing their positions around Kalamangara, Vela La Vela. New Georgia, all these areas that we've been talking about the last couple episodes with fast destroyer runs, barges, and what have you. And they're being intercepted by American PTs and American DDs. But there's really not a whole lot of heck, there's not a whole hell of a lot of success that we're having stopping these guys. We're interdicting them, but we're not stopping them from resupplying their forces here. So something has to be done. Something there, there, there needs to be new blood on the American side, on the allied side of the fight. There needs to be new tactics that need to be deployed here because this just ain't working out like we want it to work. So and the fact that Japanese are pretty much operating with impunity, aren't they, throughout yeah. this? You know, for there's a period like I think July 19th, 29th, August 1st, where they land troops and basically we don't even take a swing at them. No, no, they're, they're virtually unmolested in doing this. Um, you know, the, these convoys are spotted. That's how we know they, they drop these people out there. But we, if we take a SWAT, we miss completely. I mean, there's really mm -hmm. nothing that's being done to stop these people from doing what they need to do. So much so that they built up a force of over 12,000 men in Kolombangara just by delivering these people via destroyer or barge. So, I mean, that, that'll show you how many human beings they were being able to, they were able to move virtually unmolested by allied ships in the area. Having had enough of the Japanese reinforcement runs and the failure of the United States Navy and her allies to stop them, Admiral Halsey orders American destroyers to intercept yet another Japanese convoy that is known to be in the area and destroy it. The convoy, carrying some 950 men, was set to arrive, so Intel told Halsey, on the night of August 6th, August 7th, 1943. Now, since the beginning of the war, American destroyers had yet to be fully unleashed. You know, they had played a jack of all trades. They were plane guards. They picked people out of the water. Yeah, yeah. you know, anti-submarine warfare, all kinds of stuff, but they had yet to be used in a truly offensive manner. Mm -hmm. Necessity, you know, brings about change. And, and, and the fact that he doesn't have any cruisers to play with anymore, Halsey is forced, really, to say, okay, let's change tactics here. We got to use these DDs the way they were designed to be used. And that's exactly what he does here or what he orders done here. Um, there's a gentleman who has got a really cool name. <laughs> his, his name is Commander Fred Moosebrugger. Uh, this yeah. is his first foray into the into the arena here. Bill, tell us a little bit about about Moosebrugger and the thing and the ships he has under his command. Well, folks, I mean, folks who follow the Navy will recognize immediately there was a USS Moosebrugger, and of course, named after good old Fred. Back in these days, when the destroyers were commanded by lieutenant commanders, 
Fred Moosbrugger was Com Desron 12. So he was the Commodore, despite being a mere commander. Of course, I was a Commodore when I was a captain. Submarines are commanded by commanders. And uh, but Fred was the, the Commodore of Com Desron 12 as a commander. And he was class of 1923. He was a destroyer man through and through. Under his umbrella were a whole bunch of DDs that were either older Beckham Mahan or Gridley class vessels, you know, um, Gridley from Civil War fame, right? But USS Dunlap, Craven, Maori, Lang, Sterrett, and Stack. So it's a pretty robust destroyer squadron that Commodore Moosebrugger had under his command. But be, lack of the, because of lack of the heavier ships, the destroyers are going to be finally fully allowed to work alone and use tactics that have been scribbled down on wardroom tables ever since Pearl Harbor. So destroyer men, you know, were riding these tin cans. They were incensed at the fact that they were playing subordinate or secondary roles to, you know, the, the big guys. And they, they've been plotting all along if they ever unleash us and, and let us loose, this is the way we think we should fight our war, our destroyer war. And Bru Mo Moose Brogger and his pack of destroyers trained skillfully in the order nighttime radar directed torpedo attacks. And as such, he planned to do just that should he run into the Japanese convoy that was theoretically now coming down the slot. And so Halsey says, do your worst, and Moosebrugger is ready to do his worst. He is indeed. He leads, he leads his ships out, or he, I'm sorry, he lays his ships out in a fashion that he had always figured would be the best way to deploy his ships. Uh, he forms his force into two separate groups that are about two miles apart. Um, so as to give the Japanese a basic a one-two punch. We talked about you talked just a minute ago about the hammer and anvil attack for but aerial torpedo Which attack. Which have been doing since the beginning of the war on both sides. Exactly. And this is the surface torpedo attack of that very same tactic. His plan is to basically have two columns and run right in between the Japanese and fire torpedoes or whichever way the Japanese are going to go, they're going to run into something at some point. Uh, the Americans are told to shove off from Tulagi at 1130, make their way through the slot into Vela Gulf to intercept the Japanese that very night. Uh, the Japanese, for their part, had departed Rabaul and headed in the direction of Kolombangara via the northern side of Bougainville. Uh, the four Japanese destroyers present carried the aforementioned 950 Japanese troops, plus an additional 50 tons worth of supplies for the garrison on Kolombangara. Uh, as the convoy, Japanese convoy, rounds Bougainville, they are spotted by American aerial reconnaissance. Any chance of surprise was gone, and the Japanese were fully aware that they had been spotted. They knew that it was only a matter of time before they got into some sort of scrap with American ships at some point that evening. Um, further, aero, uh, further aerial reconnaissance tells Mooseburger that the, quote, fast convoy is what it was called was on its way, and by estimating the speed, Moosebrugger figured that the Japanese would arrive around midnight that night. Uh, as a task force enters Vel uh, Vela Gulf, Moosebrugger ordered his column to split into battle formation. That formation is that Dunlap leads Craven and Maury, while Lang, Sterrett, and Stack veered off to starboard to take their positions in that order. He's ready to go. <laughs> Moosebrugger has waited his entire career for this moment, and he is ready to go. What happens mm -hmm. next, Bill? Well, just, you know, he figured on midnight, and it turns out 2333, Dunlap's radar indicates targets 10 miles away in closing. So the picture's clearing. And remember, relative motion, the Americans are closing the Japanese, the Japanese are closing the Americans. So 10 miles goes pretty quickly. And Dun Dunlap's radio men, radar men cried cry out, um, I see him. I see them, foreign column. Yeah. So radar indicated that four enemy ships were heading towards the Americans in a line ahead column at speeds approaching 30 knots. So somewhere between 25 and 30 knots. So again, they're going to close this, this 
the gap between the Americans and the Japanese very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And as opposed to what happened before, where the Japanese had radar detecting equipment in the task force at uh, Kolombangara, they do not have that here. Not every ship had the ability. It's very clear that these four did not. Um, aboard the American destroyers or torpedo men are cranking their bearing dials and preparing to fire. Now, to Bill's point, the distance is closing at such a rapid rate that their torpedo men are actually having trouble dialing everything in in time because the, the bearings and the ranges are changing so rapidly. Um, well, the closer you get, the close, the higher the bearing rate is. So the bearing changes faster the closer you get, which makes it harder to target the intercept point on your, your torpedo control system. And as, as the Japanese are approaching, the Americans are watching them on their radar scopes, and the Japanese are sailing along in a straight column. They're not turning away, indicating that they may have fired torpedoes. It was pretty clear to Moose Brugger that they had the Japanese flat-footed, that there was complete surprise that was about to be undertaken here. At 2341, Moose Brugger ordered Dunlap, Craven, and Mari to fire their torpedoes. At that point, the range was about 6,300 yards, and again, closing, and this range is closing fast. Um, it, it's going to take about just, what, Bill, about four minutes or so-ish, give or take, for the American torpedoes to run their course? Yeah, to the intercept point, which is about 4,000 yards away from the firing point. Yeah, something like that. And so, you know, what you want to do, again, is have these torpedoes running in the water at around the same time. So the moment the starboard group of torpedoes and the port group of tor torpedoes, so the moment the Japanese detect, regardless which way they maneuver, they're going to turn into one or the other group of torpedoes. Aboard the Japanese destroyers, there is absolutely no reason to believe that they're going to run into an American destroyer column. Uh, they were, as I said, you know, they knew that they had been spotted Air, by aerial reconnaissance. So they knew more than likely that they would run into American forces at some point that night. But previous uh, interdiction efforts by the United States Navy were PT boats. And there were some DDs out there, but it was PT boats mainly. So the Japanese were more concerned with PT boats than they were American destroyers, much less a column, a two, two separate columns of American destroyers. So they, they were Japanese lookouts were told to watch for PT boats, not USDDs. Um, at 2342, lookouts aboard the Japanese destroyers began to make out dark forms on the horizon. Thinking that they were PTs, the Japanese searched for the fast-moving plywood craft when a lookout aboard Hagakaze noticed four dark forms turning rapidly to starboard. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, no, if you think it's a PT boat, then the range is a lot closer than, than it would be for a destroyer. Um, so you're kind of looking, I guess, further in, um, yeah. closer aboard. And so when you see these dark forms and suddenly you begin to, they're, they're more than just a blob. You can see superstructure and guns. You realize they're not a PT boat. The range is further out. But, oh, my goodness, you know, there's there's more than one of them. Um, mm -hmm. It's got to it's gotta increase that pucker factor. Oh, boy, you know it. <laughs> The lookout spots the four dark forms turning rapidly to starboard, which is an indicator that more than likely torpedoes are in the water. At once, this lookout recognizes the form of American destroyers aboard the Japanese destroyer Shigure. The captain shouted, quote, torpedo action port, unquote, but the torpedo director was asleep and the torpedo crewmen were on lookout duty. There was nobody home, <laughs> essentially. Yeah, yeah, there wasn't anybody. There, there. weren't at battle stations. And again, you you don't hear too many stories of laxity in the Japanese Navy like this. This is mm -hmm. very unlike them. And mm -hmm. so, unfortunately, this happens at the worst possible time. Now, it might have been that they they ran at the wrong. They weren't running down the slot. Remember, they were they ran down the north side of Bougainville Island, but they knew they were seen. But for whatever reason, and this has been a head scratcher for me for a long time, they didn't take it seriously. I mean, at the point that they were seen, you, you realize, okay, maybe I can give the crew another 20 minutes. We're going to be up a long time. 
dropping off these troops. We're going to be at battle stations a long time. I understand the desire to want to delay manning battle stations until you think there's a higher probability of an engagement. But I don't understand this. I really don't. This is very un unlike them. Um, and and for the, it's not uncommon for the torpedo crewmen to be on lookout duty and things like that because that doesn't take long for you to run to your battle station. But they should have been at battle stations at this point, in my in my opinion. And and they're going to regret not being in a moment. Absolutely. The only thing I can think of is that they knew that they were spotted. I don't think that they were expecting, and I don't have any proof of this. This is just my assumption. I don't think they were expecting to be intercepted right here. I think they were I mean, expecting to be intercepted at a further point in the in the in their journey. Right. I don't think they were expected yeah. to be picked off. Right. <clears throat> but to your point, Bill, uh, an instant later, after the Japanese captain aboard Shiguri uh, hollers, you know, torpedo action port. Kaboom, the American torpedoes start smacking in to the Japanese destroyers. Um, they, they're piercing hulls that are you know, blinding flashes as the Americans are pulling away, wondering if they had missed with their fish. Uh, three flashes on the horizon, followed by four more in quick succession, let the American destroyer sailors know, no, <laughs> we hit them. <laughs> After the torpedo explosion. Yeah, and remember the light travels faster than the sound. So you see these three flashes, flash, flash, flash. And then maybe 12 seconds later, you hear three booms. <laughs> but those flashes, um, you know, are, are gonna cause this crew to be these crews to be very excited. Um, no, don't quite know who they've hit yet, but but they know they've hit somebody. It's quite evident somebody's been hit. And after those torpedoes uh, explode, uh, following Moose Brothers' plan of operations, the American ships open fire with their main batteries, um, and they're just pumping five-inch shells into this Japanese country. Now they're tracking it via radar. They've been tracking it via radar, but now this is radar-controlled gunfire as opposed to radar-controlled torpedo fire. Um, they, they're just raining shells down on the Japanese. Um, the Black Cat above still lurking over the japanese column uh sees the japanese destroyer arashi's magazine explode boom i mean this thing just goes off whether it was gunfire or torpedoes it causes it to explode we don't know uh, but it regardless of this um the one remaining japanese destroyer that is uh, afloat which is the shigure decides that discretion is the better part of valor and retreats he's with a column of four destroyers and all of a sudden he's the only one still afloat and he says mm -hmm. we're going Where'd my goodbye go? yeah we're out of here so as opposed to ainsworth at kula gulf and colin bangara moose brugger swings and he doesn't hit just a home run he hits a grand friggin slam his victory is absolute, is it not? Yeah, you know, he, he destroyed three of the four Javanese ships with not a single loss of his own. I mean, nothing, no torpedo damage, no gunfire damage. And he proved that his tactics of firing the torpedoes first, doing what destroyers were designed to do, and then opening up with gunfire after the torpedo explosions worked brilliantly, you know, as if... And I'm sure he was not surprised by this. I'm sure none of the destroyer men were surprised by this. They were all saying, see, this is what we should have been doing all along. We told you it would work. And with his little squadron of destroyers, he gained, you know, levied more damage, had a more complete victory than Admiral Ainsworth and his cruiser destroyer force in the previous two battles, mm -hmm. which is remarkable. Yeah, you know, Mooseberger was saying, I told you so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when all, absolutely. When all, when all this was over, a total of 1,200 Japanese soldiers and sailors lose their lives uh, this night, and the troop convoy was utterly destroyed. Uh, about 300 men who had been in the water eventually reach Vela La Vela, and they, they swim there. Um, which again, you know, if you refer to the map from the previous episode, Vela La Vela is like right there. It's real close. Um, the Battle of Vela Gulf was a small victory, and it was. I mean, three Japanese ships sunk to the loss of zero Americans is a is a significant victory in that time period. But in the grand scheme of things, it's it's small potatoes. 
nothing massively consequential occurred here. You know, this wasn't a tide turning event. However, what it did was validate the theory that American destroyers should operate alone, that they should be untethered from the big ships, that they should be allowed to do what they were designed to do. Mooseburger takes this idea and proves it, you know, in the only way that really can be proved, which is in battle with a resounding complete victory here on his part. He does absolutely marvelous work out here. And in that regard, it's a major victory because it, again, we we, saw, we talk about the lessons of Guadalcanal teaching us how to conduct an amphibious assault. Though this is a lesson of destroyer warfare that, that validates what the destroyermen already believed to be true. And it carries that lesson for, forward throughout the remainder of the war. So in that regard, it might be a minor victory, but it's important strategically. Mm -hmm. And you're going to hear about a battle that we're going to talk about here in the future that occurs in November, November called Empress Augusta Bay. Uh, this is a battle that we're going to talk about. Uh, we've actually already just, you know, this is how the sausage is made. It's already been pre-recorded with Drakenfell, so you'll get to see him on our show here soon. But uh, the tactics that Mooseburger lays out here improves are <laughs> utilized, shall we say, at Empress Augusta Bay. So this is the proving ground for the remainder of the destroyer actions that occur, frankly, through the rest of the Pacific War. Bill, uh, do you have anything else you want to add to these two short but sweet events? No, I would say that the destroyer war, war throughout 1945 is so important. I think we want to dedicate another episode completely to the, the discussion of destroyers. Um, the, there, were, there were no braver crews and more impactful classes of ship than destroyers from 1943 on. So it's an important topic and you know, destroyer men throughout. And what we have today that we call destroyers are, you know, are pretty impressive, massive ships relative, related to the, the destroyers of this day. And it's hard to remember how small these ships actually were and how their, their legacy was torpedo boat destroyers into destroyers. And for such a small ship, they made an outsized impact on the conduct of the war. Mm -hmm. Couldn't say it better. Couldn't say it better. So with that, we want to thank you for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War Podcast, wherever you receive your podcast. Give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. Also, if you want to see the video version of this and any of our other shows, please tune in to our YouTube channel called Unauthorized History of the Pacific War Podcast. Please like the episodes and subscribe. If you have a question, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. And once again, my name is Seth Perrin, and I want to say thank you very much for listening in. Bill. And I'm Bill Toady. See you all again next week.